Welcome to this event uh, by Champaka Bookstore and a Libre Copy with Mario Santanera, author of Still Life, Mirrors and Windows. Uh, I'll just introduce us all to you uh, and then we'll do a reading from the book and followed by a discussion. And at any point, if anyone has any questions, there's a question and answer box at the bottom. So please send in your questions there uh, and then we'll get to them. Uh, so Champaka is an independent women-run bookstore, children's library and cafe. We bring diverse stories and perspectives for our readers and in our children's library through our books and events. We have an online store that ships across India where you can find all the books on our shelves and I'll put in a link to buy Still Life in the chat box um, so you can get a copy of that. The Library Copy, which is Daphne Hall and Sarasija, is an independent non-profit publishing house dedicated to the realization and circulation of works, projects, and writing by artists. The Library Copy also undertakes long-term research projects, organizes workshops, hosts events, and will soon curate exhibitions. The Library Copy is based and was founded in 2018. Mario Santana holds the optics of being. Mm -hmm. You want to start, Mario? Was again, you're, you're getting cut off a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, internet issues. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> you hear me for the rest of the event. Uh, Mario Santanella is an artist whose practice explores the optics of being. Guided by research on architecture, light based technologies, and storytelling, he explores how these devices condition behavior and represent social realities. Still Life Mirrors and Windows is his first book published by Reliable Copy. I'll just introduce, like I'll talk a little bit about the book as well. Um, so the book moves across personal anecdotes, moments in history, cultural memory, and scientific did you knows, and takes the reader on a virtual journey across a range of sites with a GHT and sites as in physical places. Um, at once factual and speculative, poetic and analytical, still life is a window that reflects and a mirror that pierces through, a gentle companion to our endless search for the limits of understanding. And I'm going to put a link in in the chat box. Uh, and now over to Mario for a reading of the book. Hi, thank you everyone for joining in. Thank you, Nika, for the presentation and doing this event. And thank you to Reliable Copy for this amazing project we've done. Um, so I'm very happy to introduce the book with two readings. One is the first section of the book, and then I'll jump to like the final third of the book without uh, telling about the end. So I'm going to share my screen and we'll go through the book and uh, I'll read these two sections. I don't know how to do this. Okay. Okay, let's start. One day when I was walking, I saw a leaf falling from a tree. I ran to catch it before it could touch the ground. After staring at it for a while, I went back to my studio and hung it on a string from the ceiling. This leaf has never touched the ground. This slowly became a habit. I would take some time out each week to catch a leaf and bring it back to the studio. At any point, I would easily have about 20 to 25 leaves hanging. Once, while waiting for one of the leaves, I saw a fruit fall instead. I then also started catching fruits and hanging them in the studio. 
One day, I opened the door to the studio, only to find that one of the leaves had fallen and landed on a table. When you ask someone what the first words Neil Armstrong said when he landed on the moon were, they say, that's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. Actually, those were not the first words transmitted. The first words were, okay, engine stop, which was said by co-pilot Buzz Aldrin, who inspired the name for the Toy Story character Buzz Lightyear. So what he's actually saying to the world, to the base on Earth is, okay, the engine has already stopped. But here it's like he's talking to the engine, telling it to stop, which is very interesting. It reminds me of how Dr. David Bowman talked to HAL 9000 in the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, which came out a year before the Apollo 11 mission. And then Armstrong says, Houston, tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. They use an animal as a metaphor for the rocket the same one that's the emblem of the United States of America, and Tranquility Base because they landed in a crater called Tranquility. When he says this, this he names it, and by naming it, it becomes a base. If they went to the moon, we will go to the sun, but we will burn and die. Well, we will go at night. At the beginnings of astrophotography, what it now seems we've come a long way from, they would put cameras in telescopes and take pictures, then wait for a complete year, go back to the same position and try and take the exact same picture again. Each time they saw that the stars, planets and the different extraterrestrial objects had moved in a way different than what they were expecting. But they continued cataloging these objects. After a long time, they realized that what they were cataloging was actually the dust resting on their lenses. You can trace back how NASA has been inspired by 19th century paintings, especially the romantic landscapes representing the American West. To portray the recordings and findings, the type of landscape where you would imagine Sheriff Woody from Toy Story roaming around looking for the bad guys. This was a way for them to mediate their technical images and data to a wider public in a friendly and catching way. They hoped that this would generate more popularity from them, encouraging continuing, continued financial support. These images of the American West became a way to evoke an Ameri Americanness of exploration, which has then extended to how the whole world saw outer space. It's also interesting to look at the black hole image that's very popular now and how it is a misrepresentation to call it a photograph because it is actually an illustration of data compiled from different telescopes and processed to create a visual output. For me, it is a contemporary parallel to the two paintings by Johannes Vermeer, the astronomer and the geographer, making sense from a room through a window. The black hole, it's interesting where the name comes from because it's, it comes from Calcutta in India. I don't know if you know that story. Somewhere in the 17th century, a group of about uh, 1700, sorry, of about 150 prisoners were thrown for three days in a very small dungeon where they died of suffocation. The black hole was the soldier's name for that dungeon. We now use that word without knowing its etymology. 
This black hole picture is a perfect repl reflection of our viral pop science times, a natural yet uncanny update to the history of horizon representations, a black image that functions as a mirror to its viewers, to our times. It reveals the mirage of the horizon. Really, that image is everything, because in that image is the black space, the black room, the horizon. It's so accurate that it's so popular because we live in an era where everything is so filled with images that just an image which has nothing and it all happens in the mind would work for its function. The horizon has always been linked to the unknown. The offing is the limit of perception when you're looking from the beach at the horizon. The offing is the horizon the sea meets the sky for different reasons, it was believed to be the end of the world. I remember being fascinated by old maps where limits were described by phrases like unknown land, here be lions, here be dragons. People back then were more accurate on this affirmation than us believing it as nonsense, because for them, the space after the horizon was represented by either fiction or darkness, the end of the world. Back then, there wasn't an established idea of the horizon, since no one had gone to it. It was perceived as a limit. They thought things would fall down, that it was, that it was an edge, and there is something interesting in that. It breaks the idea of the mirage of the horizon. The horizon as a virtual entity that does a lot of harm to humanity. Nowadays, we no longer have to go to the edge to experience the horizon, but an image is enough like the one of the black hole, which is thousands of light years away. So this distance becomes the new end of the world, the place where our perception stops, which is also represented by darkness. There's this video game that I like to play called Journey, where the player controls a rock figure in a vast desert, traveling towards a mountain in the distance. In this game, the limits of space are actually invisible, and the whole thing is like a storm. So it's very similar to the limits we live by right now. When the character gets to the limit, the storm starts and he gets thrown back to the world. He can try as much as he wants, but he won't get there. Unlimited attempts will, met, will be met by unlimited storms and the end result will remain the same. So this is the end of the first section. Um, and now I'm gonna jump like, I would say like 110 pages um, okay, so Nihal is telling me if I should go back to the images of, of the chapter to walk you through a little bit about the images we just saw. So the, when you open the book, you decide the first images, which is of Journey, the book, uh, the video game I'm telling you about. And this is the character getting to one of the limits, which is an invisible limit. And when he arrives there, it is to control your gameplay. So, so you don't go out of where they want you to go. So when you get to one of the limits, a storm starts and the character is pushed back to the, to the scenario. And this um, last year, um, after 50 years of the moon landing, they released all the footage, film and picture footage. So we, it was very interesting to go through all the, this new footage of this event. And we chose these pictures from that event. And also this uh, portrait, uh, then this representation of this same crater but like 300 years before by a scientist if I could uh, start talking and don't stop. So I'm gonna try to go. But if you want to know the story, I'll tell it afterwards. And these are the two paintings I mentioned by Johannes Vermeer, the geographer and the astronomer, both of them working from inside a room through a window. And these are some of the paintings we I just mentioned of the American 
Mountain West. And this is a um, speech uh, that uh, it was written in case of the moon landing being a catastrophe uh, or having or if they had an accident. This was the speech the president was going to read. Um, yeah. So it's like a, that for path where the history could go this way and it went this way. So, but we have like a like a sign of what this path would have been. More pictures of the landing, and this is Boss Aldrin, the co-pilot, and Boss Lightyear having a, a, a talk. And this is Blender, uh, uh, 3D modeling software I use, which I'll talk in the next section about. And this is a render I found of, a, well, actually the model I found of a, and this room in Toy Story. So here we're making a drastic jump in the book. So um, I'm just going to mention this ones before reading. I'll come back to, oh no, I'll come back to them afterwards. I like that toy. Okay. When I was very young, I would repeatedly ask my mom and my doctor how I could know for sure that they weren't aliens doing tests on me. The only human I could assure really existed. I know this story because following every answer they would give me, I would think for a while and come back to tell them that their answer could have been said by an ET, by an alien. That used to greatly frustrate my mom, but it also ignited in me a constant theological inquiry to rethink my reality. There is something about looking at an airplane through the window of another airplane that is fascinating. Seeing airplanes from airplanes is so uncanny and bizarre, but looking at a car from a car is so mundane. I keep coming back to the two paintings by Vermeer. What's intriguing is that one studies the earth while the other studies outer space but both of them do it from inside a room through a window. And there is a lot of implications to this, like how the structures around them enable this, or the kinds of resources like the globe or the book that they have in the room extend this. But ultimately, it is about how they create knowledge about the world from a room through a window. It's very similar to how humans still work and function today. When I started using Blender, a popular 3D modeling software, I encountered this NASA archive that had some downloadable textures and objects. One of them is a robot that they use to fix things at the International Space Station. I downloaded this robot and placed it on Blender to start learning how to move it and to use it to move around other objects. In the same archive were also landscapes of Mars, Mars highly detailed scans of the topography of the planet. I see these files as windows, the same way the geographer and the astronomer saw their tools, the same way the early explorers saw the mapping of discovered lands, a map of their possible possessions, a way to grow the supply room. Virtual space is one of the perfect mirrors of humanity. The more we understand about this, the more we understand ourselves. It's where we act the most human, because we created that space with infinite possibilities with unreachable horizons, with planes and spaces that expand endlessly. It's very much like our imagination of outer space. At the early, at the early stages of virtual space design, Martin Newell, a computer scientist, needed an object that he could model featuring very specific topographies. He wanted to test out how it would act in the space he was creating how the shadows, the angles, and the surface of that object behaved in the conditions imposed by that space. Noticing his frustration at not finding an ideal object, his wife, while having tea, suggested that he try modeling their teapot. Newell made preliminary sketches and to his surprise, found that it was indeed the ideal object that he was looking for. This is how the Utah teapot became one of the signature virtual space test models. 
This teapot was crucial to how virtual space design developed. As a result, a lot of animated films and series have paid homage to it. The original teapot, the one that Newell measured, was produced by the German company Friesland Porcelain and was named Household Teapot in Europe until 2017. When the company realized the importance of this product, they changed its name to Utah Teapot, commemorating the University of Utah where Newell developed the pioneering graphics technology. For me, it's fascinating how this object that, be, that comes from a pre-virtual time is now linked to the virtual one. In 3D modeling software, the virtual world is usually presented through color. What happened here is that we to be able to identify the location of objects, to position them in space and distance. So what they did was to assign RGB values to the X, Y, and Z axis where X is red, Y is green, and Z is blue. Depending on where the object is in the virtual world, its surface will change color. Color becomes a place in space. It acquires three-dimensional values, or at least the illusion of it. And even if the point is only virtual, it becomes a space, a landmark. With the advance of CGI technologies, 3D modeling has become more complex and this and this color model is not only used to understand the location of an object in space, but also the different layers that compose it, material, light reflection, surface, and topography. What dictates the normal of an object in virtual space is now the gaze of the user, not its origin. All of this is now in relation to the viewpoint, to where the user is seated, and the camera through which he is rendering the image. It all revolves around the screen. With the black hole image, all of this changes because there is no single viewpoint at play. It was an image taken by eight telescopes that recorded information as well as distance, separately. The point of the viewer becomes the Earth. The eye is then distributed around the world. It makes me think of where the mind of this creature exists. And then the book continues. So I'm gonna go back to the images again and give you like a brief of. So I included this um, here, there's three, but there's more in the book. And actually I don't end up mentioning this part, uh, we edited it out, uh, which is uh, a collection I've been doing for a long time of representations of Adam and Eve. Uh, throughout art history were in all these representations of all, or all the representations I found until now, they're represented with a belly bottom, with a navel, and actually Adam and Eve were uh, born by, by like a natural human birth, so they shouldn't have a belly bottom. And so um, I'm, 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 I'm curious about why they have been always represented with a belly bottom. This is uh, some of the explorations I've been doing in Blender. One of the homage to the Utah teapot in Toy Story. One of the homage in The Simpsons where that, uh, so at one side of Homer it's this blue cone and in the other sa side there's the Utah teapot at the back, red one. And uh, uh, on the other hand, it's some more renders I've been doing in, in this ones were done in Google SketchUp, which was like my first renders uh, of an installation. Uh, on the left, I, oof, I forgot his name, um, but it's, uh, it's one of the first, uh, it's proto, it's the early stages of photography, proto photography where the, um, this, the Oriel Window South Gallery, Lacock Abbey, it's called, by William Henry Fox Talbot. And it's one of the first images ever taken. And on the right, it's uh, some, exa some explorations I was doing with protophotography, putting paper in the window for the sun to burn it. This is a scene of the, of the Little Mermaid, uh, 
where she asks herself what uh, what is burning and how does it feel since she has never cooked. Um, yeah, I think this will be more explored in the book, but on the left it's uh, a painting which I really like uh, of bubbles and spheres and it has to do with like the world and yeah. And on the on the other side there is uh, something called the death spiral, which is um, so when ants are going to get food and coming back to their, I don't know how you call it in English, English, the ant hole, um, they leave like a trace of uh, pheromones for them to smell where to go and where to come back. But sometimes the, the moving and coming back from those places move the pheromones and they create like a circle where they will continue following the pheromone endlessly in a cycle until they die of exhaustion. Yep, and that's it. Yeah, that was good. Thank you so much. Uh, again, if anyone has any specific questions, I mentioned this in the beginning, uh, but just type them into the question answer box so we can get to them. Uh, I have a very basic first question which is just where did the idea of, of this book come from? Did you have it all sort of fully formed when you, right at the beginning, how did it evolve? So it was a very uh, <laughs> time consuming um, exercise. It all started uh, back in 2017 when Nihal and I were in Beirut doing the Ashkara One home workspace program and uh, we were both fellows the same year and we started talking about art and Nihal mentioned he wanted to start a publishing house and so we started about uh, talking about books and and what like and like virtual with space and how they can merge and all of this and 2018, well, after that long talk, we said like, okay, we've got to do a project together. And that's where the project started. But the project, I think, was such a complex um, conversation that was, was then when I arrived to India was a, uh, expanded with Cersei, yeah, Rush and Koyo or all the reliable copy team. So the book never, I, if you tell me when, when you had the final idea of the book, I think it was when we sent it to print because it, it was it's such a complex uh, project that we were always like, like going with it until the end. But uh, yeah. even during printing it changed again? because we realized the printer could do some things and couldn't do some things. And by this time, Mario is already back in Bogota and we're in lockdown in India. That's when production actually happened. Oh, wow. So that was also, the book never really finished until it was in our hands. But what was like the initial thing? How did you, what did you start with? So, um... So that's the thing. We, I don't know when <laughs> when it starts because it just happened to be. But right before going to India, I was in Beirut where I was going to do a performance and uh, the performance and all that uh, festival got or that symposium got cancelled. That forum got cancelled because um, the, the Lebanese uprising started. So, and, and, and what what was for me very meaningful that was that even if the events would happen, it was certain that people won't, wouldn't come, you know? So that for me was like a, like a changing uh, moment for this publication. Because what I like about the book is that it's always there ready for you to read it. And, and whatever happens, you are the one deciding when to open it, when to read it, and 
uh, which is completely the opposite to a uh, video installation of performance where there's technical stuff that has to be installed and everything for it to happen. Um, so that was like a turning point that we were, okay, I think it, it has to go, it has to be a book and a physical book. Because before that we were thinking of a compilation of things that included a lot of digital uh, interaction. That's interesting actually, because like, uh, again, with the like video uh, that we put up on our Instagram, you can find it, I, we can send you a link to it after this, if you want to see it. Um, but there are lots of stills from that. I mean, obviously it's the video from the book, uh, but I thought it was interesting that uh, it's a moving video and it's a book called Still Life. <laughs> uh, uh, my second question is, um, so you go through a lot of, I said this in the beginning again, but there's like, there's a lot of personal anecdotes and there's lots of moments in history and there's lots of actual like facts. So how did you bring that together? What was the process of curation for that? Because I imagine, like you said, there were bits that didn't get put in the final book. So how did you sort of bring them all together? What did you think of when you were doing that? When we, and whenever Nihal and Sersija want to answer the questions, please uh, also, also do. Um, but um, when we had like a, so, so the book was like a roller coaster, like this mountain behind me, like it had peaks, it had falls like this. And when we were like not stuck, but we were like here asking ourselves what we were doing. Uh, so we, we started to talk and I started, because initially when Nihal invited me was to do a project that would uh, show the research behind my practice because a lot of my projects you don't end up seeing all the vast research behind. So Nihal wanted to share that. So when we were like in that moment, Nihal told like we were just talking and I was talking to him about like, um, yeah, like this is connected to this and the world and virtual space and now it's affecting this and, and this has to do with how we're going to go to invade Mars in the same way that we, like the explorers came to America and we're repeating this cycle and it's going to be all the same, da, da, da. And Nihal was like, you know what, just record yourself talking and I, I want to hear this again. Because he actually was doing a residency in, in Germany. So, so I recorded it myself and then he calls me back and he tells me like, hey, I think we have the transcript for the book. So the transcript of the book started from a, like a rant of me telling Michal and Sersija a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another thing that I thought was interesting, especially when we were showing the um, scans from the book, is how did you plan the layout? Because a lot of it, while I was reading it, is I'd look at the visuals and then read you mentioning those visuals and then I'd go back and I'd be like, oh, that's why this is in here. So how did you plan that in sort of laying out the book? I think that was such a, um, like all the book was such a group decision that I would like Cersei Journey Hall to join me in answering this one. Um, I mean, it's like, uh, like Mario said in the last, response. The book didn't have a fixed form when we started. It wasn't planned to be a certain way. I mean, as far as the forms for the book went, we even thought, what if it's a video? What if it's a PDF? What if it's a website? And from there, finally, we decided, no, a traditional book will finally emerge from this collaboration. And then Mario, as he described, we did the transcript because none of us could commit to what this book would be in any singular way and Mario especially at that point he was also considering doing prints with thermal ink that you could handle and it would change color and then finally we said you know this is all very confusing we are in two different countries we just have to decide on something and then finally the transcript happened and then it was about when along with the transcript I mean along with the lecture that he kind of recorded he also made a PPT showing the pictures that he's talking about and then we said then that's the format the presentation is the format and then we broke the book down as presentation images and then the text presentation images text presentation images text so the black pages are all presentation images and the text kind of deals with those pictures 
after laying that out, we said, okay, but there's so much else that we've talked about in this last year that's related to the book, but it doesn't really come into the presentation. So how do we bring that in? So we sliced it up into chapters and put a break between each chapter. So after one chapter, there's an illustrated section. Then after one chapter, there's a documentation of a video Mario made. After one chapter, there's a fold out page with another illustration. So that kind of started to break the book and come in as well. Even the journey pictures we saw, the desert landscape was a break, a starting break. It began the book. Uh, so even like the, the belly button drawings, they're not talked about in the book. So yeah. okay. that's really interesting. Why did you decide to, like, did you think that that would impact reading if there's not, they're not explained or explored? Because I didn't know about why the belly button pictures were in the book when I first read it until you just mentioned it right now. Interesting choice. Yeah. Sorry? Back at you, Mario. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so... I think that's that's an opening for volume two. So, <laughs> so in volume two we'll we'll start with the belly buttons. <laughs> but actually, I I also see because we we wanted the book to be something that you would read whenever you had the time and everything. But we also wanted the book to to be challenging in a way in which you would also look at some images without information so you try to make sense of them then you read something which maybe it's another another grasp to those images very different to the one you were making sense with you know and then you come back to them and then there's other images that there that there's no explanation so i'm i'm, I'm my work always have like those uh, broken bridges where the viewer or the spectator has to make sense of what he is doing which is actually what i what my work is about is making sense of reality so so it's like inviting the reader to 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 enter in that exercise of making sense of something Uh, what was your process of research with this book in specific? Is it all things that you've done for previous projects and things that you've been thinking about? Did you do any research for this in specific? I, I think everything was somehow... Like, everything was um, somehow previously or deeply researched or barely scratched and then in the book we went full deep in all the research but i think i'm trying to to think about all the image ah, there's just one image which was uh, uh, inserted right before i left india which was i'm going to show it to you because uh, I took a break and I went uh, um, traveling through India and I saw this Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> he has to show the book now oh, yeah, I think so, it's better page 69 yeah there you go mario yeah which is also an image i don't mention i don't uh, mention in the book but uh, it's the armor that this um, king would put to his horse and at the beginning he was ridiculed for this but then um but then uh, when they went to battle, battle with the, uh, the enemies used elephants and elephants don't attack baby elephants. So the elephants uh, thought the horses were baby elephants and they weren't attacked. So that's the only image like I, I really fought for having with, without uh, like deeply researching about.
So Mario, we have a question from Leslie. So I'm going to bring her in. Okay. Hi, Leslie. Hi, hi. Um, hello, Mario. Thank you for your presentation. And um, thank you to Reliable Coffee and Team Chapaka for providing this opportunity. Um, so my question has to do with um, like what in what tradition of artist books do you feel that you are working in? Who would be your kind of fellow travelers in the world of artist books with this kind of um, nonlinear narrative? Like when you say you can pick up the book and open it any place, I think of kind of Hans Petter Feldman, but it's also um, pointing to other artists. So what I'm just curious to hear if you have thoughts on that. Hi, Leslie. Thank you for the question. It's it's a very good question because uh, I the first book I was to I started like getting more into reading art art uh, artist books and um, right before going to India I was in Beirut and they have like in Ashkar one they have this big library of artist books so I the first days I, I was spending a lot of time there reading researching uh, seeing how the layouts and everything but then I got to um, to India and Nihal has a very like thought like very precise thought library of artist books and I think the books that were there were the ones like talking to us while we were doing this process and it's it's a vast like number of books so there's a lot but I was at that time also reading uh, a book by Ed Atkins oh. um, called Oof, I, I forget, I, I have it here, I, in, I can go get it and tell you the, but it's the first book he published of his writings and um, well, he jumps a lot and it's just text, there's no images, but I think that I connect in that way of thought of jumping and, and bringing back stuff and like, yeah, so, so that book for me was very, very, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 It was uh, an in, like not an inspiration, but it was like a no, like a companion through the process. Nice. Okay. Well, Thank may you. I, may I also add to this, um, which is that as editors, um, I think we also had a role in kind of pushing you towards this broken format, mm -hmm. and for us, it kind of came from, at least for me, it came from an experience of editing film. Mm. Uh -huh. it's kind of put out in okay now this audio and this video and then this audio and this video and then you kind of shifted around to kind of break that mm. so I would say the book has been informed by some amount of video editing and I mm. feel that that also then closely relates to Mario and his work which mm. is heavily video related or performance related mm. okay thank you thank you Anyone else have any questions? Just feel free to raise your hand, send them in the question answer box. Um, yeah, actually, I wanted to know a little bit more about the process of collaboration. So was it like an easy collaboration between all of y'all? Because it seems like many people had a hand in this. Uh, with the printer, there's like so, so many steps in this, right? No Just... collaboration is easy. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> Mario doesn't want to comment on the collaboration. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I think in, Nihal said it. Like, no, <laughs> no collaboration is easy, but uh, and, and and it can turn out very bad being like so so close, uh, Nihal and I. But actually, it turned out great. I think I think it's um, it was an amazing collaboration and. I met so much in, like like friends in India and yeah for me it was very enriching and the outcome we're so happy with it and I'm 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 hoping we do a second one so that will reflect on how the collaboration went. That proves the collaboration in a certain manner. 
I guess the other side of that answer is also because every all of us were playing all the rules, so there was very little demarcation in the sense of us being editorial and Roshan being the designer and Mario being the author. Like all of these lines got very very blurred. Um, also because all three of us are practicing artists parallelly, and we're now running a publishing house, and all of us have a little bit of. So everyone became the designer. Everyone became the editor. The designer was doing a lot of copy editing. I did some illustrations. So everyone was kind of doing everything. So that concept of collaboration, also, I guess, like it was true to its form. It wasn't just like a publishing house working with him. So that changed it quite a bit. Okay, that's me. Are you working on the second volume? <laughs> I but, am. Uh, they don't know about it. No, but, <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah, we didn't know this at all. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, I think we we need like five years of rest after <laughs> this. Do you think this this process is something you could replicate like online, like without you in person? Because a lot of it, like you were in the same place. A lot of it, you weren't. Skype calls, messages. Do you think that could happen like entirely online? No, I think we have to be in the same place for a while. The book actually started one year before uh, my arrival to India. So, but it, it, it like it ignited when I got there. So I, I after this experience, I would say it has to be all of us like in a cave, just like to, 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 to working on it. Yeah. But it's uh, kind of interesting because we would have skyped for a year before Mario came to India, and then towards the end, the last two or three months, Sarsaj also joined in, so it was the three of us skyping together. Then Mario came to India, but it was weird because I had to leave for two months. Mario's come for four months, but I'm not there for the first two months. But luckily, we could meet before I had to leave, so we had two or three days together. But when I was away again, the book didn't make much progress. Everyone was still trying to figure out what this book could be. And I'm getting really frustrated because we have to have the book out in two months, but no one knows what the book is. And then it was only after I come back and we're all finally there together in one place that it really starts to take shape. And Roshan, the designer, also kind of moves into our house and he's also just permanently there. And that's when it really took form. Okay, um, I'm done with my questions. So if either of you has anything to say about the book or the process of making the book and if anyone from the audience has any questions now's the time to send them in if there's anything you want to say generally about the book this is a good time to say it <laughs> i guess uh, i just had a small comment about uh, the origins of the book because i remember when we were still in beirut in 2017-18 um, before reliable copy has even started. So far, we only have the name and the logo. We don't have even a registration. Um, I remember it was towards the end of our time in Beirut, and I remember Mario sitting in the library there on his computer, putting together a slideshow of these belly button pictures of Adam and Eve. And I went up to him and I said, You know, this is the book we want to make. You know, <laughs> this is it. And then he was like, No, 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 this is something else, and I don't want this to be a book. And, and we forgot about this. And then two years later, it's a chapter in the book. <laughs> That's true. You don't think Mario realized this? <laughs> I was tricked. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> questions. Mario, anything you want to add to anything? No. No, thank you everyone for joining us today. It was very nice. Thank you for uh, organizing it. And yeah, thank you very much. There's a question. How can we get it? Uh, I, put, I put the link in again. It's available on Champaka's website, um, Mission Podcast India. And. Oh, I didn't put it in the chat box earlier. Just a second. Here's the link for everyone. You can pick up your copy of the book here. This is only for India. It's available in Europe through Motto Books in Berlin. And it's available in America through Printed Matter. But they're out of stock at the moment. We're sending more copies soon. 
it got sold out but you can you can uh, we found uh, it's also available through amazon online so it's also up there in america as well yeah yeah through amazon general your friend ordered and got it yeah from mexico okay oh that's amazing okay this link will work for india uh, yeah <laughs> exactly but the question was asked anonymously so now we don't yeah yeah but if you have, yeah buy from chantika you'll buy from amazon yes please support independent bookstores thank you <laughs> anything else anyone questions comments no questions no comments We we'll have to start calling names. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, office. it's fine. It's fine. Telling them to respond. Cool, but. What technically is the end of the world? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you to Nehan and Sarasi Jan. Thank you so much, Mario. That was really, really interesting. Thank you to you, Nidika. We hope to do this again for your next book. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.